this video, we're going to discuss another psychological approach to explaining gender, social learning theory. And I imagine you're familiar with the basic principles of SLT, and we're going to cover what you need for gender here. But if you want a slightly deeper look at some of the key principles, or just a reminder, you can check out the social learning theory video in the approaches unit. The specification also asks us in this area to consider the impact of culture and media on gender. So we're going to look at some additional studies so we can answer those questions directly. So is gender learned from those around us? Let's find out. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos and the Discord channel. Social learning theory as applied to gender development. Social learning theory is a combination of cognitive and behaviorist ideas. Its main idea is we learn our behaviour through experience with the world, and this of course will include behaviour that is gendered. The process of socialisation is when children learn the norms and values of a society, and these vary massively depending on the culture they belong to. And they learn to imitate members of the culture by seeing those people rewarded in some way for gendered behaviour. So, as an example, a female child might see an older girl praised for completing housework or playing quietly, while a male child might see an older boy get praised for helping with DIY or taking part in a competitive and aggressive sport. These younger children experience vicarious reinforcement and are likely to want to imitate the behaviour that they've just seen. Now, the fact that in society different behaviours are rewarded depending on the sex of the individual is called differential reinforcement. In social learning theory, we consider role models. These older children are role models for the younger children, and they're likely to be siblings, but role models could also be friends or parents. These real-life role models are called live models. But importantly, we also have symbolic models. These are people in the media, so in storybooks, on TV, and film characters. If they're live or symbolic, these models are more likely to be imitated if the individual identifies with them. So they see the model as like them. So that's factors like gender and age. And as this is social learning theory, behaviour, including, of course, gendered behaviour, is only going to be imitated if the individual performs the mediational processes of attention, they have to see the gendered behaviour happen, retention, they need to remember the gendered behaviour, reproduction, they have to think they're capable of performing the gendered behaviour, and finally, they need to have the motivation to reproduce the gendered behaviour such as having seen someone else rewarded for that behaviour and they're hoping for the reward themselves. Now, you can think of any gendered behaviour and plug it into this process. Social learning theory, research evaluations. Our first research evaluation is a really clever study that examined if differential reinforcement is real. Smith and Lloyd got 32 mothers who had recently had their first child to be participants and told them they were doing a study investigating and play. They introduced them to a stranger's six-month-old baby and asked them simply to play with the baby for 10 minutes in a room with a selection of toys. The researchers recorded the participant playing with the baby from a hidden camera. Now, the babies used were either biologically male or female, and they were either given sex-appropriate names and clothes, or they were given cross-sex names and clothes. So, half the time the mothers were playing with babies that were dressed and named in a way that made them think they were the opposite sex. Now, I think you can guess what the researchers found. When measuring the first toy choice, the masculine squeaky hammer was only ever given to the babies dressed as males, and the feminine doll was only ever given as first toy choice to the babies dressed as females. So, the infants are being encouraged immediately to play with the gender-appropriate toys. Not only that, but the researchers assessed how the babies were encouraged in their play. And what they found was the babies dressed as boys were given significantly more encouragement for large physical actions, like attempting to crawl or walk, showing that even as infants, boys are encouraged to be more athletic and confident, taking risks. So, pretty good evidence there of differential reinforcement, the mother's play style being shaped by their own gender stereotypes. Now I've said that identification is more likely if you're the same gender. But growing up, siblings are going to be a massive role model because of the similarity in age and the likelihood of seeing them rewarded and punished by parents. 
But what if that older sibling is the opposite sex to you? Will seeing them rewarded and punished for their gender behaviour alter your gender development? Another study by Rust looked at the influence of sibling role models. Gender behaviour was assessed in 5,500 three-year-old children. Over 2,000 of these children had an older sibling. Half the same sex, half the opposite sex, and over 3,000 had no siblings at all. Analysis of the data revealed that if you had an older brother, you're more likely to show more masculine behaviour yourself if you're a boy or a girl. If you had an older sister, you're more likely to show more feminine behaviour if you're a boy. Now, this is correlational research, so there might be other factors that explain this finding. But it's in line with social learning theory's suggestion that children will observe and imitate their siblings' behaviour, potentially picking up cross-sex gendered behaviour. Culture and media. Now we might need to answer questions just on culture or media's role in influence and gender roles. And we've already hinted at some things. But let's add this. The gender stereotypes that we see in each culture do vary. The socialisation that's performed by peers, teachers and parents, so society, depends on the culture you're living in. This means that each culture's exact gender stereotypes are distinct and get passed down to each generation. We've already mentioned that symbolic models are what we see in the media, but the role of the media in people's lives and shape and values is thought to be pretty big. If normative gender roles are displayed as attractive, then we're more likely to want to imitate them. And if you think about it, what happens in movies, especially aimed at kids? Often it's the pretty princess that's rewarded by being saved by a prince and living happily ever after in a castle. A strong male superhero uses justified violence to save the day and is praised by society. Now, is watching this kind of content from an early age teaching little girls the most important thing to focus on is fitting a beauty standard and being dependent on males, while telling little boys that it's justifiable to use aggressive violence to solve your problems and the people around you will be grateful? And we can add on to this that media varies between cultures and it's often a reflection and a reinforcement of that culture's beliefs. Culture and media research evaluations. So we're likely going to need some evaluations of culture and media's role in gender development. The classic research in this area is by Margaret Mead. In the 1930s, her work on tribal communities around the world gave a view into groups of people whose cultures had developed in isolation. In New Guinea, three communities had very unusual gender roles. In the Mungdugamo tribe, both genders were highly aggressive and competitive, traits usually associated with masculinity. The Arapesh had males and females showing feminine caring behaviour. And the Chambuli people had a completely reversed gender role. This culture expected females to show leadership and dominance, while males were passive, emotional and responsible for child rearing. Now, the fact that human communities can vary so radically suggests that gender roles are a product of culture and not a fundamental biological process. Now, these next points are about the media's role in gender development, but you'll notice you can also adapt them to using a question about social learning theory or culture, depending on your emphasis. Adverts are a pretty distinctive feature of television media, and they're about persuasion, persuading you to buy something. Fernand and Mac collected studies from 11 countries that assessed how sex roles were stereotyped in the adverts in that country. Now, they were careful to pick countries from across the world. The sample included the UK, Kenya, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Mexico. Now, even though these adverts were from very different cultures, they found some pretty clear patterns. Women tended to be shown in dependent roles, so a parent or a spouse and they were more likely to be shown in the home and as a user of a product. Men, on the other hand, were shown in professional roles. They were more likely than women to be shown in locations outside of the home, and they were more likely to be the authority on the product. Now, what this suggests is across cultures, gender roles are shown very stereotypically in the media and may possibly be reinforcing those gender roles by providing symbolic models. Now, this is an example of psychological research being influential in the real world. In 2008, the European Parliament, concerned by the potential effects of gender stereotype in the media, passed a resolution. 
They said that as the evidence suggests that gender stereotypes in the media reinforce narrow gender roles and reduce life chances, especially for women, this resolution requested that member states avoid stereotypical portrayals of males and females in TV. But an interesting counter study by Eismid. The researcher gathered 64 studies on gender stereotyping in adverts and found that gender roles were highly stereotypical. Okay. But this data also indicated that ads were getting less stereotypical and the reduction in stereotyping was due to changes in the society that the adverts were shown. Now, the researcher argues what this means is gender stereotypes in the media simply mirror the stereotypes in the culture. They don't mould the stereotypes through social learning. General evaluations. Now, one significant criticism of social learning theory is when we try to apply these ideas to examples of atypical gender development. Many people experience their gender identity as not matching the sex they were assigned in infancy. Now, society's response can result in significant distress leading to gender dysphoria. So, as social pressures punish people who don't conform to gender normative behaviours, and constantly shows gender normative behaviour as rewarding, social learning theory struggles to explain exactly why people would continue to show cross-sex gendered behaviour. The fact that people do go on to display atypical gender development despite the social pressure might be better explained by a biological explanation of gender. And while Mead's research did show some unusual examples of gender roles, these are exceptionally rare and might have been influenced by researcher bias. There are actually very few examples of societies where the normative gender roles are not males are more competitive and aggressive, and females are more cooperative and caring. As so many cultures around the world show this pattern, it suggests there's a biological element to some fundamental behavioural differences. And these can be explained by evolutionary pressures in which men compete amongst each other for mates, and females are responsible for early child rearing. But psychological understanding of how social learning processes can result in a reinforcement of harmful gender narratives can lead to interventions. For example, making visible in the media positive role models of female mathematicians and scientists, as well as caring males who take an active role in childcare and housework. But the gender roles in modern culture are becoming less strict than traditional society. For example, the use of gender neutral toys and the encouragement of girls into STEM. And you've likely also noticed that children movies by Disney now show women as far more empowered. Now, the fact that culture's gender roles can change so dramatically within a generation suggests that gender is socially constructed and transmitted through socialisation, not biology. But while social learning theory fits better with the fact that gender roles have changed, as it suggests that gender isn't an essential biological process, it doesn't really explain how they've changed. Social learning theory explains how gender roles are maintained over time. People in other culture see gender normative behaviour as rewarded, so it's reinforced. In this theory, it should mean gender roles stay the same over time, as anyone who deviates is punished by disapproval, and everybody else learns through vicarious reinforcement to behave in a gender normative way. Now, once new gendered behaviour becomes acceptable, social learning theory can explain how people can adapt to that new way of behaving, but new gender normative behaviour has to become acceptable first. And answering the question of what end of traditional gender roles is an interesting question, but it would likely move us out of psychology and into politics. But one question you should be able to answer now is this from 2018. Give it a go. I want to thank everybody who supported this channel over on Patreon during the development of the gender unit. You've helped make the development of these A-level videos possible. And if you're a Psych Boost patron, then you're on level and above, you can access six bonus gender tutorial videos over on psychboost.com. In them, I'll talk you through a model answer for the exam questions, and I'll talk you through some general exam tips based on the exam reports. But for everyone else, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the videos released right up to your exams. And I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video, Atypical Gender Development. <laughs>